Do you feel like you've ever given a bad tour? Yes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And you're thinking, well, that's probably the worst tour I've ever given. You're finishing up the tour, you're wrapping up the tasting, and you say, well, you know, really appreciate you being here, and, uh, you know, if you'd like to come back and see us again, uh, you know, feel free to do so. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they explode. Wow, that was the greatest tour we've ever had. <laughs> and you're going like, well, where did that come from? You know, like... Hey everyone, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that Freddie Johnson is making a reappearance. He's always a pleasure to have on as a guest on the show. We're a bit of a time crunch, so we didn't get as much time with him as we wanted, but that just means we'll have to have him come on again at some point in the future. This week's iTunes review shout out goes to BPB32SF, who said, Kenny and Ryan have perfected the podcast. The audio is top notch, the content is getting better and better. And the website is extremely easy to navigate and find specifics about what distiller you want to hear about. I have learned a ton and keep learning with something new with each podcast. Thanks again for that review and giving a plug about our new website. We've definitely come a long way since the first few episodes, and I think we finally got the hang of this stuff. We are inching closer to having 100 reviews on iTunes, so please keep them coming. We've seen a good new amount of Patreon supporters coming to the site as well. So thank you to everyone who is supporting us to help make this show great. And we're actually getting even closer to that new goal. We'll be able to give away a bottle of bourbon every single month. So make sure you support the show and go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash bourbon pursuit. And you're gonna help us grow. With that, enjoy this week's episode. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703.
Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Uh, Kenny here again, the official podcast of Bourbon, and we have got a repeat guest on again today. We've got Freddie Johnson. Freddie was back on episode 59. He is the third generation employee of Buffalo Trace. So Freddie, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me back once again. <laughs> so what's been going on since last time we talked? Uh, more visitors. Mm-hmm. How more weird, right? visitors. A lot more visitors. All right. Uh, Kenny, I think the running 12-month count now is we're getting close to 200,000 visitors through Buffalo Trace Distillery. So that's up, I think, maybe about 17% of over the last time you were here. Well, it's, it's, it's continually growing then. So I know we're under a short window of time here. So I kind of want to, I want to give everybody a little refresher of who you are and kind of dive into it. Um, but give everybody that hasn't listened to that past episode uh, about, you know, a little bit tidbit about your family uh, and maybe who, who, who's going to carry on the, the legacy as well. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that that'll be my grandson. Uh, my daughter said, forget it. She's not rolling any barrels. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, had my grandson over here, Osiris. I've had, had him over here, first time, six years old. So he's now 11 years old, and uh, he's uh, looking, uh, looking forward to helping Grandpa roll out the uh, 7 millionth barrel, which is coming up the first part of next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, they hope to hit it. Um, but, yeah, um, started off here five years old, holding my granddad's hand, um, visiting the distillery that uh, he and my dad worked at. And I was like uh, Willy Wonka in a chocolate factory. I mean, I was fascinated, not with whiskey making, I've been around that all my life, uh, but I was fascinated with all of the things that went into making a bottle of whiskey. Uh, uh, The mechanics, uh, the wood, uh, the yeast, the different grains, and all of those are components that ultimately make up a cool, cool bottle of bourbon. The ABCs, right? Pretty much. You yeah. T- you talked about that today, oh, right? Oh yeah. So that was that was a fun thing, and that blows everybody away because uh, the fundamentals of bourbon are pretty basic: uh, artificial colors and flavors aren't allowed. That's your A. Newly charred white oak barrel. That's your B. And C. The dominant grain has to be corn. But you don't limit yourself to the basic ABCs. So we've discovered there's over 300 chemical flavors in white oak. So you don't have to add anything artificial, but you do have to give Mother Nature and Father Time the opportunity to do their thing. The B is a barrel, newly charred white oak, but guess what? Nothing at all about species of white oak or country of origin of white oak. And white oak actually grows all over the world. A lot of people don't even realize there's an Irish white oak, okay? Uh, Mongolian white oak, it's associated with one of the highest rated whiskeys in the world. They've been to Mongolia. They didn't take I've never me. been to Mongolia, so I have no idea. Well, they didn't take me with them when they went either. So <laughs> don't feel bad, Kenny. All right, yep. Uh, but um, a Mongolian white oak barrel, I think, cost about $1,000 for one barrel. Yikes. Yeah, so they didn't give very many. I was about to say, yeah, that's not, that's mm. not, a, that's not a scalable business right no, there. No, 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 no. So uh, volume doesn't cover that. Mm. Uh, but then uh, it takes longer for the whiskey to age in barrels that have uh, a large amount of growth rings. And so when you go into countries that uh, have short growing seasons and extremely cold, you get a very dense wood that takes longer for the whiskey to penetrate. So you really have to be patient with those to give Mother Nature a chance to allow the alcohol to break down the solids in the, in the uh, fibers uh, of the wood. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I started off with that, uh, just watching dad and granddad and listening to the comments. Um, the cool part, Kenny, is I've been very, very, very blessed. I've been fortunate enough to be here with three different living master distillers. And that's where the C comes in, the corn. There's nothing about species of corn or color of, color of corn. And corn grows all over the world, Okay. So if you look at a cornucopia and you look at all the different colors of corn, each one has a different taste profile. There's nothing about any of the grains. So uh, the reason I'm excited about being at Buffalo Trace right now is uh, they already have over 14,000 experimental barrels of whiskey. So we've already made the bourbon of the future. And what people don't realize, like uh, on previous uh, broadcasts, you know, you've been talking about the aged bourbons that people are going out and looking for right now, 
Well, that's the whiskey that Elmer and Dad put into the warehouse. And the whiskey that we're making today is for 2025, 2030, 2040. Mm -hmm. So that's for the next generation. So it's hard for people to understand when they say they can't get a bottle of bourbon that they enjoy. The demand for that product was created, you know, 10, 15 years ago. That it's just a false sense of demand, right? Like they they don't they think they want something that really it's it's readily available. They're just look they're not looking past the either a label or an age statement or whatever. It no, is. they want it. Yeah, they, yeah, they really want it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they really want it, right? <laughs> they are desperate. Uh, but um, a lot of times, what happens is they pay a large sum of money for one of these bourbons that they've heard so much about. And I've had people come in and they finish up on a tour and they'll comment, oh yeah, I had some of that. And they'll tell me how many thousands of dollars they paid for the bottle. And then they'll comment like, I was totally disappointed. <laughs> like we don't sell anything that's actually a thousand dollars a bottle, right? So. And, and I asked this, uh, this one guy when he was, he was doing this in front of a group of people on my tour. And I said, uh, I said, well, sir, I said, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I said, but have you ever bought a new car? He said, but of course. And I said, well, did you just buy the car without trying it out? He said, no, I test drove it. And I said, well, I would just think that before, <laughs> I, before I paid several thousand dollars for a good bottle of bourbon, I said, I might go to a really nice restaurant or bar and maybe get a flight and try that one along with two or three others to see if I really want to pay that much for that bottle of bourbon. And I tell folks, all the time to do that. Uh, don't just be caught up in the hype. Um, value is based on your perception. Right. And so for me, I'm just as happy with a bottle of Buffalo Trace or Eagle Rare or Weller 12. I'm just as happy with that as some that you may pay, you know, two or three hundred dollars a bottle for. Right. That's awesome. So uh, there was a, there was a, some cool tidbits that I kind of wanted to capture today because we we had a, a tour with you earlier today and there were some things that I had never heard of before. And I think it was it would be a disservice if I didn't give that to the, the people or the listeners of the show. And the one of the things that that was really intrigued me was the origin of the shot. Right. We <laughs> talked about that in the very at the front of the gift shop. And all I remember is 12 cents and a bullet. So so go ahead and let's school some people real quick. Well, it's really kind of funny. The way that the whole thing st got started with the term when a person went into an old bar or saloon was, give me a shot, give me a drink. And back in that period of time, early, uh, talking about the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, a good drink of whiskey cost you 12 cents. Well, there are people paying $275 a shot for Pappy right now. Good drink of whiskey, 12 cents. But you've been out on a trail for four or five days. You're broke, you're busted, you're tired. All you want is a real good drink of whiskey and a place to lay your head. But you don't have any money. But remember, back then, everybody had a gun. All right? A 45 caliber bullet out of your gun also cost you 12 cents. So you would swap a bullet from your gun for a good drink of whiskey. Hence the term, a shot. That's pretty interesting, though, huh? right? Like, pretty I, cool. Where'd you hear that from? Um... We started going back, trying to figure out where all these terms and stuff were coming from. And we started going back into a lot of the old books that were written uh, about the history of whiskey and bourbon and all that. And all these things started to, be, to reveal themselves to us. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty kind of cool. Uh, uh, you know, Mike Veach and those old guys, uh, they're into all that kind of stuff. Fred and those guys, they, uh, they go back and they do a lot of research and it helps for us uh, to be able to validate some of the things that we've heard. Uh, we get a lot of uh, uh, books that people come in that they've written. And then we'll, the way it works is, is that uh, Mark Brown, our president and CEO, says it's okay to say some of those things as long as you can validate it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to back up those types of things uh, when you make comments. You don't want to be spreading white lies here while you're giving Lord, tours, right? No, 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 no. So that's the last thing we need. I heard, I heard Mark, when he retires, he wants your job. Oh, he still pretends to be a, a, a tour guide. Yeah. We, we catch him every night trying to be a tour guide. <laughs> no. Um, he probably uh, set the stage for um, allowing the tour guides to um, basically uh, provide their own personality. 
uh, while they're giving a the tour. So uh, your delivery, uh, we have some guidelines of things that we're required to say, but each tour guide, based on their background, brings a little bit of something different to the table. And it's really, uh, it's really fascinating to sit around and listen to people uh, comment on how they may have taken a, a tour with, let's say, a Jeff Warnicke, who used to be with CSI. So he's a chemist. So he can put that little special spin on it and, and deal in depth with things regarding that. Uh, Coy a Trapp, he was an ag professor. And so he can talk about grains and uh, the soil and compositions of soil and things like that. Uh, we had another guy, Dave Fisher, who was, uh, he was uh, into the division of forestry. We could talk about oaks and saps and rosins. And it, I mean, it became, uh, we have uh, another guy, uh, Don, who is a historian. And uh, Don Flynn, uh, he hooks up, he does a lot of special things associated with history. Uh, I can go on and on. We've got a, a, a guy, Bob Gates. He's a local. He's a folklorist. And he goes around meeting with folks and talking about um, the folklore and whiskeys and the settlers and all that. And what it does is it brings the distillery to life. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool part. And I think that's what excites me the most is sometimes I get a chance to listen in on what they're doing. And we kind of like ping pong back and forth off of each other. And... Uh, you can see folks getting into it, and they began to live Buffalo Trace. And that's the cool part. That emotional connection is what really makes it work. Well, I think that's what brings people back, too, right? We talked about it before you came on. That's, that's why people bring their friends and all these other things, because they do have that connection, right? Yeah, yeah. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. So there's, uh, there's something else I wanted to bring up, right? Because uh, we all know the names around here. We've seen, uh, we all know the history of Colonel Blanton. We know George T. Stagg. But on the, the, the tour today, I learned something that I didn't know about. And it's part of the antique collection. It's just a name, but I never really dug into it. And that's Thomas H. Handy. So yeah. give me, give us, give us a little uh, education on who, who this guy was and what the influence he had and, um, you know, whatever it was and Sazeracs and Rise and Bitters <laughs> and all that, whatever, right? Uh, Thomas Handy was actually a chemist and he worked in an apothecary. Um, and the uh, first whiskey cocktail that was made was a Sazerac. Okay. So two famous drinks when you go to New Orleans, a Sazerac and a Hurricane. Well, the rye whiskey for that cocktail came from this distillery, Buffalo Trace, okay, back in the day, back in the 1800s. Hence the name, Sazerac Rye, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's where that came from, all right? Um, the, uh, in honor of Thomas Handy, 
making the first whiskey cocktail, they named a whiskey after him. And that is where Thomas Handy Straight Rye Whiskey came from. Okay, it was done in honor of him. They release it once a year. It's part of the antique collection. Uh, but Thomas Handy uh, had discovered by taking things out of the apothecary and mixing them with whiskey, you could enhance flavors in whiskey. And one of the products that he used was bitters. Okay, so bitters was originally created to calm the stomach like Pepto-Bismol does today. Uh, but uh, people that suffer from motion sickness, if they're going on a cruise, will stop and get a small bottle of bitters um, to take with them. Bitters has the same calming effect on your stomach as Dramamine without the side effects. So he was using bitters. I do the same thing because I need a Manhattan to calm my stomach down sometimes. You know? An old-fashioned Manhattan, there you always go. hit it with a splash of bitters, all right? <laughs> So he uses a little device to measure out his ingredients in that bartenders still use today. And that's a little double-sided cup. Mm -hmm. Which we uh, commonly refer to as like a jigger, right? Yeah, jigger, jigger and a half, because it's two different sizes, all right? But it's really a double-sided egg cup. And it was originally uh, created to grade your eggs when you brought them in from the farm. And you just put your eggs in that cup with the pointed side down, depending upon how your egg fit in the cup, that determined the, the, how much you were going to get for your basket of eggs, okay? Basically, based on the, the size of the egg. But in French, that little device is called a cockatiel. And a cockatiel became a cocktail in, in requesting a mixed drink instead of a shot. See, now you're, now you're schooling us all over the place, right? When you say about the, the, the measuring things, all I can think of is like um, uh, the dangerous catch or whatever that, that, that is on... Uh, uh, the Discovery Channel, where they sit there and they bring the crabs out of the ocean, and they measure how big they are and to see if they get thrown back or something like right, that. Right, yeah. yeah. But it, it kind of goes the same thing with eggs, right? Yeah, yeah. So you got your basket of eggs, and that's going to determine how much you're going to get for your basket of eggs. Uh, but it's, you know, to me, uh, you, you start looking at all the things that set the stage for bourbon as we know it today. Uh, a lot of folks, when we come in here, they all, they all say, uh, well, well where, did, where did bourbon come from? And I said, well, it, it came from whiskey. And they said, well, how did, it get, how did it get its name? And most people don't realize that this territory went from Fincastle County, Virginia, to Bourbon County, Virginia. And Bourbon County, Virginia was named after the French International family that owns the French International Banks of Bourbon. So this territory went from Fincastle County, Virginia, to Bourbon County, Virginia. Okay? Uh, Bourbon County, Virginia encompassed 21 counties in this immediate area. Uh, it set the footprint for the state of Kentucky as we know it today. During that period of time, they're cranking out a new sweet tasting whiskey that doesn't have a name. It becomes known as Bourbon County Whiskey. And later on, they dropped county from the name. And Bourbon Whiskey, and it's a combination of corn, whiskey, rye whiskey, and barley whiskey. Well, we're going to change the name of the podcast to be Bourbon Pursuit now, then. I think that's what it should be. Oh, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> <laughs> so there's one more thing I want to talk about before we let you go here, and that's uh, the Bourbon Pompeii, right? Because I think it's uh, might be the, the newest thing that you're going to start showing, right, as part of your tour. So kind of give an idea of what is Bourbon Pompeii. Um, believe it or not, it is the uh, part of the original OFC distillery. And what was happening was they were uh, home place. I was getting ready to do an expansion and create a business center. Uh, it was going to be a three-story uh, complex that overlooked the river, okay? The contractor goes in to uh, uh, clear out for the elevator shaft, raises up a piece of concrete, and basically says, whoa. I think, what do we got here? Yeah, I think y'all might want to come and look at this before I go any further. Um uh, what he had discovered was when he raised up this piece of concrete, he had uncovered the original OFC distillery. The fermentation vats, the drop tub, the whole shebang, the way it was laid out. And they went back and got some Sanborn maps and they were able to confirm things that had been here before. Um, they found pieces of old copper down in the bottom of these vats. Uh, Sent that to the forensic lab. And they were just limestone vats, too, weren't they? Is that what they were? Or uh, what well, were they, they built were out of? Basic, basically, they were, it's almost like a mortar vat. It was a sealed okay. vat, but they were copper lined. So E.H. Taylor had this thing that to make good whiskey, it always needed to be in contact with copper or with wood. 
Okay, so they were actually aligned with copper, and copper would uh, cause even, even heat distribution, so you didn't have hot and cold spots in your fermentation tub. Um, so anyway, so they turned the archaeologists loose in there. They started doing a dig. Uh, they found uh, multiple fermentation vats. Uh, they had a structural engineer come in to shore it all up uh, and found out that what actually happened was uh, Taylor was expanding the distillery, had it just about complete, Lightning strikes the thing, <laughs> burns it down. He gets aggravated. He just has them to bulldoze all the stuff over into the fermentation vats in the drop tub, covers it all up with concrete, and just builds on top of it. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, yeah. So do you remember that phone call or whatever it was? It was like, Freddie, you got to come check this out. We were, we, we were piddling around over there, and uh, somebody said, you'll never believe what they've uncovered. And... Uh, when they first started over there and the archaeologists started to do the digs and they started finding uh, artifacts that went back to the 1800s, the 1700s, uh, then I, I became fascinated with the whole thing. Nicky uh, is the archaeologist that's back there doing it, uh, Nick. And he's, uh, we're going to try to, we're trying to see if we can't do a little, we're going to do a partnership, a little ping pong off of each other. Okay. And he's going to he's going to talk about the uh, the dig and the findings and I want to talk a little bit about history, and we're going to play around with trying to recreate something that uh, somebody coming in, taking a tour, could basically relive the experience of being in there and living that life. Well, I, I saw part of that because I noticed you were you were part of like a uh, some virtual reality thing that's been being built too, right? Uh, <laughs> like you're you're part of a virtual reality tour. People can just put on the goggles and, and actually go visit Buffalo Trace, right? And oh yeah, and they could take a tour of Freddie. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but uh, when you see it, uh, it, it it's, uh, it's humbling to see where this distillery actually started and you really get an appreciation for where it's, where it's heading. Uh, as uh, Mark Brown said one time, he says, we're just keepers of a legacy mm -hmm. and we're just preserving what was here for the next generation and uh, the, I guess the most sobering thought of all is uh, Ronnie Eddins, before he passed away, we were doing an oral history uh, interview, and his comment was, you know, if you came to a distillery in your early 20s, and with everything you knew about whiskey making, you made the very, be the very best batch of whiskey you knew how to make. By the time they're called expressions, you know, like you have your 10 and 15 and 20, like your pappies. He said, by the time your last barrel reaches its final maturity, he said, you're about 45 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's your first run. So you make another run. And by the time it reaches its maturity, you're about 70 to 75 years old. He said, what is amazing is in this industry, it is very rare that these old whiskey folks ever get a chance to taste their third batch to its final maturity. He said, that's the legacy you leave for the next generation. So when I look around at the folks that I'm with today here at Buffalo Trace Distillery, and I think about uh, Elmer, and I think about Gary Gayhart, and now I've got Harlan Wheatley, and you think about what Harlan's doing today and the footprint that he and Mark Brown and uh, Meredith and all of them are setting, and Drew. I was say, let's not forget about Drew Maysville, right? Yeah, no, Drew, Drew is kind of like he's the mad scientist in the chemistry lab. Uh, but they're putting together uh, some of the best whiskeys that the world has not yet mm -hmm. encountered. So there's a, there's, a, there's a good future about what we can expect, right? Everybody's excited at Buffalo Trace about what's about to happen. Do you feel like you've ever given a bad tour? Yes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yes. You really have. Yeah. Well, what do you, how's, how, how do you think that you really think yeah. you've given a bad tour? Like, do you think people are, uh, they say something mean to you? you, you because I'm, I'm sure you, you don't read your TripAdvisor reviews or anything like that, do you? No. No? No. Um, uh, it's really funny. People will comment about that, uh, like TripAdvisor or Yelp or something like that. Uh, they'll say, did you see something on Facebook? And uh, I'll say, no. And they say, don't you go in and look at that stuff? And I say, no. And they said, well, well, why not? And I said, it's... It's, that's not that's not why I'm mm -hmm. here. Uh, so I just don't, you know, I'm sure if it was something bad. Right. 
uh, Matt one of them informed me that they <laughs> came out on TripAdvisor because they have to look at all that stuff. Oh, that's because uh, sure, most restaurants like take that same exact mentality. They're like, I'm not going to read TripAdvisor. Like, I'm going to do the best I can do. And if by some reason, like, you know, one day I get the itch to read TripAdvisor, but they don't want to read it every single day because it just makes them go insane because they either think, oh, you know, we got to we got to pivot because if one person said something bad or anything like that, right? Mm-hmm. You just got to keep continuing on what you're doing. But. Yeah, um, but um, you know the uh, public relations staff uh, and the uh, home place team—they're constantly monitoring um, comments, mm-hmm. uh, not just on a tour that Freddie gave, but uh, on the uh, the site itself, uh, experiences that they had, no matter what it might be. Um, the tours, um, we've got five different tours that people can take, so there's all kinds of input that they constantly monitor. And if there's something that uh, needs to be addressed uh, or something that's good, uh, they'll reinforce that mm-hmm. and let us know. Um, but I just, uh, I'm just not one that at the end of every day I go in to see what somebody said. I just, I don't, I just don't think that that's a cool way to do it. Right. Um, I do like it when um, I'm, let's say, getting ready to do a tour. I'm walking through the gift shop, and someone will, uh, they'll say, "Hey, it's me." We came back. We thoroughly enjoyed the last time we were here. We brought friends. Yeah. So that's the, uh, that's the reinforcer that makes you feel good about being here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kicker is sometimes, like we're talking about the bad tours. Oh, man. Okay. Um, you'll be trying your best to make them happy. You're thinking, I'm just really doing the best I can, and there's no response. They don't smile. They don't even look around. They just, yeah. Just they're, monotone they're, as yeah. can be. Yeah. And you're thinking, well, that's probably the worst tour I've ever given. You're finishing up the tour, you're wrapping up the tasting, and you say, well, you know, really appreciate you being here. And, uh, you know, if you'd like to come back and see us again, uh, you know, feel free to do so. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they explode. Wow, that was the greatest tour we've ever had. (laughs) And you're going like, well, where did that come from? (laughs) So, but um, what's amazing is, People come to the distillery with, um, you never know the baggage that they're bringing. Mm -hmm. You never know really why they're here. Some people are coming excited to be here and others are coming, let's just go do something. I need a distraction to get me away from whatever was bothering me before. Uh, Some people are coming in to learn about the making of the product and others are coming in to understand the history and how it evolved into what it is today. And all those things are really kind of cool. So you really have to kind of monitor your group and figure out, well, let's see what we've got here first. And uh, I try my best not to do a canned tour at all. I Mm -hmm. mean, I try to base it on what they're excited about or what they're really interested in. You can gauge it. You can gauge a group. Put it that way. You try. Yeah. You try. Cool. Well, awesome. So I know uh, we're kind of cutting the gun here, so I want to kind of end it on that note. But Freddie, thank you again for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure. Uh, You know, we're probably going to have to have you on again, right? Because I got a whole load of questions that Uh, I know you got to run off to another (laughs) tour right now, but uh, But, we're going to have to make it happen one more time. Kenny, thank you very much for having me back on again. And uh, like I say, it's always a pleasure. Um, And uh, like maybe the next time we do this, we'll be sitting down in Pompeii. Well, yeah, we should do and, that. Uh, we should do the, that. Maybe the fermenter will be uh, the fermenter down there will be bubbling some mash, and we can just yeah, you guys got to expand somewhere, right? Oh yeah, that'll happen soon too. Yeah. Well, that sounds right. good. We won't Thank give you it very much. Time. Thank you again, Freddie. If you like what you hear, make sure you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, all those good places. Uh, if you also make sure you uh, you say if you got a friend that's getting into bourbon and you, they they drive a lot, you say listen to this podcast. It's the best way to kind of get this through word of mouth and just spreading the message of, of bourbon love and knowledge to everybody. So make sure they do that. If you do like what you hear, give us a review on iTunes. We can always use more. And if you uh, run a company or work in a marketing department of whoever it is and they want to advertise and get in front of uh, you know seven. 7 to 10,000 listeners per episode. Make sure you send them in my way. Uh, go to burpursuit.com and look for the partnerships tab at the very top and you can get in contact with me there. Uh, with that, thank you again, Freddie, for being on the show and we'll see you all next week. Mm-hmm.